Well, I was going to try to read some stuff. I've been here a couple times, and I didn't want to read stuff that I had read before. So I went up to Jim, and I said, oh, he said, read whatever you want. So I said, that gets me off of the, you know, off of feeling like I have to read other stuff. I, I, I want to read. There's certain poems that I just like to read by certain periods of time, I guess, like anybody so I want to read this, these poems. Um, bear with me if, you, if you've heard them before. This piece uh, was a piece that I, I wrote a year um, after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. And um, I went uh, the year, I believe the year that I went was the year that, that Danny and his family went also, if I'm not mistaken. And, um, so I wrote this piece based on what I, I saw. It's called, I Come to See for Myself on the Anniversary of Hurricane Maria. I should write one for the major earthquake they just had, too. Um, maybe I will when I go to see what's going on over there. Anyway, I fly in to see for myself below blue tarps over the homes of my nation like those silver blankets that cover the souls of Mayan and Arawak children locked inside cages on the U.S. mainland I left behind. Arriving home, I enter a mass of confusion. Plantain crops walloped in their places of birth, five-foot-tall grass rebelliously ar advancing to heaven. My mother's lemon tree on her last leg, hunched over, barely breathing. I witness it for myself, splintered wooden electrical poles held up by a neighbor's twine. Trees arrowed through one another, now growing sideways, surviving. Not the palm trees, though. The palm trees chose victory or death. No in-between half-hearted living, some growing new hair, others simply guillotined by Maria's detonation. I walk into the new growth of forests, Detect the low lamenting sounds of the injured there. Witness the anger etched into the undulating mountains surrounding me in the distance. I see the U.S. cavalry arrive just in time. Cortez and Columbus repackaged into a 21st century nightmare. Armies in metallic flying machines using talking devices, exchanging messages in foreign languages through invisible airwaves. I see the cavalry arrive to help themselves to the casinos they built, to hurl paper towels at the local mortician, to seize their opportunity to maximize on the extinction of the natives, keeping them in long drawn out darkness with no power to run hospitals, no shelter with no water. I cross the land from west to east, south to north, to see the revelers and the ruin for myself to lend an ear to the survivors and to the dead, see shattered schools for miles along the route. I run out of fingers on which to count them all. Part of the plan to ruin us, a small voice reminds me. I walk along the turquoise shore, lined of amputated homes, crumbled fences, collapsed doorways into the sea, inside bits and pieces of Families remain, their vestiges now across the Atlantic at the opposite end. Back in Ponce, I sit in my mother's rocking chair, watch the neighbor's hummingbirds, who've arrived to visit her ruby coral bells. I think of my father's strength in his humility. He walked in silence, built a house to withstand a cyclonic catastrophe. I've seen for myself the natives are the majesty of this world. Together, they've cleared the paths, sawing, hewing through mammoth barriers of deceit and loathing, retrieved their own water, traversing the inundation of Washington's elite that vowed to drown them. They went about their lives by the light of a candle or an old wooden light pole they stitched back together with all the love on earth, maneuvering through a world of cadavers, 
inside Maria's eye amid the tantrums of the privileged. A nation held its ground, now raises its foundation of ancestral eminence anew. Um, it's fitting that we're here when uh, this clown is over there talking uh, nonsense. And, um, you know, I'll tell you, man, if we don't get rid of these people, he, they will completely destroy the United States. Give them four more years and that's it. It's over. So we really have to get rid of these. It's not just him either. He has a whole crew, just like Hitler. It wasn't just Hitler. He had a whole crew that, you know, unfortunately, a lot of them got away. And a lot of them were sheltered here in the United States, too, which is something that nobody should ever forget. Um, so I wrote this poem when he was coming, when he, whatever, they put him there in in the office and I had a major breakdown and you know, I knew, I knew, I said, this is really, really bad. Not just bad like Bush bad, but really <laughs> catastrophic bad. And I knew it, I knew it, you know? So this is called Ushering in Armageddon on the eve of Trump's election. We rapidly disappear all drinkable water, ramming in gorge steel pipes like a rapist's penis into the earth, injecting its insides of vile poisons, lacerating its core, leaving warm, radiant grasslands stippled of, gray, of dark gray gaseous machines, rusting, oozing mucus onto the countryside, choking vaporous clouds rising from rivers, waterways cloaked with upended salmon, beaver, birds, assorted insects we'd yet to encounter. Mass extinctions of other life forms run amok before us because of us. We indulge in gluttony, zealots for crude oil, nuclear fuel and intangible futures. We indulge in greed, craze for imbecilic video games, prime time and commercial ads, making others rich and our minds poor. We coddle our narcissism, the idea that we are invincible, all-knowing, masters of the universe, superior to all life forms, yet ignorant of countless creatures inhabiting the depths of our own planet's seeds. We sentence ourselves to wrath, placing madmen at the helm of a nuclear empire. We fornicate with money and palm oil lovers, torching vast swaths of Earth's forests, decimating acres at whim. We sentence ourselves to deception, choosing fanciful illusions. We are Leviathan stars on a global stage, existing only inside the flat screens of our cracked skulls. We sentence ourselves to sloth, lethargically sitting by, witnessing the implosion of even our own families, never lifting a finger, never troubling our carcasses out of cushy, cheap sofas bought at Walmart on Veterans Day sales. We splatter everything over of syrupy affirmations that the skies are crimes, that mask our cataclysms, our inertia, our self-inflicted Armageddon. Like a junkie shooting up that last dose of bad endings, a rehashed nightmare, how utterly foolish we are. I was very upset at the people. <laughs> And still, I mean, what's going on here, we should be doing what's happening, what they're doing in Hong Kong. I mean, it's incredible. You know, if they're their kids locked up in concentration camps and cages and nobody's on the street, nobody's breaking anything, nobody's, you know, um, what are you gonna do, you know? We, we need to really not just walk around the corner with a sign, holding a sign, you know? I mean, that, that's all right, but, you know. Anyway, I'm going to read these, um, these two poems that have to do with, actually with 9-11. Um, 
And I don't, I, I usually do not read these poems. I don't read these poems. So I figured, well, why not read them tonight? Um, and one of the poems is a poem that was featured in the, what was that, that thing that they put me in, the 9-11 thing in, in PBS special, whatever it's called, Going to Work. And they featured it, um, It's just very nice. On their daily trips, commuters shed tears now, use American flags like veiled women to hide their sorrows, rush to buy throwaway cameras to capture your twin ghost. Frantically, I too purchase your memory on postcards and coffee mugs in New York City souvenir shops, afraid I'll forget your facade. Forget my hollowed Sunday morning path train rides, my subway travels through the center of your belly. Afraid I'll forget your power to transform helicopters into ladybugs gliding in the air, to turn New York City into a breathing map to display the curvature of our world. And the other piece that I wrote for the for 9-11, I wrote a few, but the other one that I like a lot is called For the Iron Workers. Um, I had a reading that I had to do with Staten Island shortly after that occurred, and so they were still over there in, I think what they called it, the pit, and they were taking apart the uh, what was remaining of the towers. And I had to go do that reading with Pedro Pietri, who was a great poet. And we, they left us at a certain, the, the um, taxi left us at a certain place. We had to walk the rest of the way because they were not allowed to go down into that area. So we had to go walk right next to that, the pit, um, to get to the um, Staten Island Ferry. And he was really upset. <laughs> he was, why did you bring me here? And I'm like, I didn't bring you here. I didn't, you know. It wasn't my, but when I saw that, and that, I, that captured that in my mind, so I wrote this piece for the iron workers. The iron workers came stacked with tools in the naked night, a night devoid of grace, devoid of warmth. They arrived weighted down with giant surgical instruments, hauling them through rubble like cattle climbing canyons. The iron workers toiled for nights and days, sunken in a mass of debris, in a sweltering heat, in the smell of death. They worked to dismembered what remained of the tallest towers on earth. What they had given birth to, they labored to bury. How, how much? One more. <laughs> Just that one. <laughs> I'm just wondering. Um, I'll read two more pieces. This piece I don't read either that much, but I, I've been wanting to read it for some reason. I don't know. It's, it was, it's about my father's death. Um, and my father's death and my mother's death, they were both nightmares, you know, living nightmares. So I captured my father's death. I, ha I don't think I've captured, my mother's death was very intense. I don't think I've captured that yet. But in any case, this is called From the Moment You Died. From the moment you died until it was time to bury you, it poured windswept torrential rains, lightning and thunder shaking the coffin your wife chose from a full color glossy catalog. It rained ceaselessly day and night Gray permeated the meals we ate in the kitchen while you lay just a glance away in the living room, clutching a set of black rosary beads, your, your hands folded under a dainty white veil. Our little cement house saturated as the family stayed up all night, keeping you company, joking around from time to time, crying from time to time. It was someone else's dream, my rummaging through tin cans of crackers to eat with cheese at 4.30 a.m., my sweeping and mopping around you, arranging the folding chairs, your morning guest 
would sit in to visit with you, assuring myself they'd be color coordinated, just as you'd wish, blues with blues, grays with grays. It had to be someone else's dream, as daylight shone through the front door that never closed all night, revealing the white water crashing into the land, the sky wide open, crying. I stood in your kitchen, watching the procession of shadowy figures under dark umbrellas one by one. They came to verify it was you. It was really you, Salomón Mercado Torres clutching those black rosary beads, dressed in your brown polyester suit, lying in that box your wife picked out of a color catalog, Toñita, the mortician, provided. Oh, that was hard to read. And this is the last piece that I'll read, um, and thank you for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it, and thank you for having me. And. Um, Please think of, uh, you know, Puerto Rico's getting 10 to 15 earthquakes a day. I, I got an earthquake app because I wanted to keep tabs. And, uh, you know, I guess those are, what are the aftershocks? I mean, it's really crazy, but it's been going on since the major earthquake hit. So that's one thing. The other thing is Australia is decimated. And we need to really put our good thoughts that way and send money or whatever if we can. They're really hurting. I mean, it's horrible. Apocalyptic, you know. Um, so this is called Epilogue for the 21st Century. And, you know, 2020, I mean, what's going on, man? Everything's topsy turvy Since the minute 2020 hit, everything's shit's been hitting the fan left and right. Anyway. <laughs> crazy, you know, people dying, you know, all kind of crazy stuff. Okay. Epilogue for the 21st century. And the demon took possession of the nation, leading it by the hand in circles, engaging in topsy-turvy talk, weaving and unstitching gnarls of lies, dangling morsels of double talk and innuendos. And the nation jumped in attempts to capture those morsels, if only for one second, to distill them into reality, to identify them as black or white. But the demon kept changing the meaning of all things, kept morphing his empty shell of broken bits and shiny charges of wickedness enshrined in glassy vials. And the nation, contorting and heaving, drowned in a melee of arguments, and weapons, and hurricanes, and earthquakes, and wildfires, and special reports on the evening news, while the demon's henchmen went out into the world and defiled the rivers, defiled the women, defiled the poor, defiled all the good creatures of the earth. They were hell-bent, maniacal in their derangement. They were the leaders of the free world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.